Hey everybody, it's Jay Bear from Convince and Convert, joined today by a very special guest, Erica Napolitano, author of, I have to do the actual iPad wipe this time, The Power, <laughs> I usually have the book, but just not going to go iPad, The Power of Unpopular, Un oh, she's got the book, The Power of Unpopular, <laughs> A Guide to Building Your Brand for the Audience Who Will Love You, and Why No One Else matters. Erica, how are you? Thanks for being here. Any better and I would be twins. Wow, I don't even know what that means. It's <laughs> freaking me out. If the world can handle two of me, there would be two of me right now. There you go. How's the book doing? I loved it. It was such a refreshing read. I really, really enjoyed it. I tore it through it. It was great. How's the book doing? The book is doing great. The publisher is absolutely stoked about digital sales. You know, when your book came out last year, Amazon releases the Kindle edition when they like. <laughs> so, Surprise! And, yeah, I'm like, somebody's like, hey, I just ordered your book. I'm like, you, you, you did? <laughs> so no email, Kindle. no notification. It just appears. It's the craziest yeah, it's thing. It, it, it's like it man Kindle edition just manifests. Yes. Yeah. Um, but... The uh, the feedback from the Kindle edition has been great. Hardcover sales are going fantastically. We have um, you know, we have our own publicity goals, and we're starting those this next week. But the initial feedback, I mean, even unsolicited feedback on Amazon from people um, who didn't get advanced review copies, I'm just grateful. You know, people are sharing feedback, and we're looking at really kicking off the the forum for the book this next week. So it's exciting. It is exciting. It is exciting. <laughs> Um, one of the things that you actually say in the book is that the book itself didn't turn out how you had planned it necessarily. What do you, what did you mean by that? Well, I mean, anybody who follows my online persona, which is redhead writing is probably opening the book. And even the early feedback I've gotten, they were expecting me to smack people around um, because that's what redhead writing does. And people enjoy uh, people who are fans of that brand, enjoy that style. But this book is by Erica Napolitano. And when I went through the book, and even through the editing process, um, I got to the end and I looked at it and I was like, I learned something in this process. It, it's really cool to get to the end of your project and go, that's not where I thought it was going to go, but I'm really happy with where it's at. And it's a lot like owning a business <laughs> because when we start a business and, and you have started multiple businesses yourselves and successful, successful exits, when you start a business, you, we have these, I'll, I'll call them daydreams about where we think things are going to go and how they're going to be on a day-to-day -day basis. And the reality is much different. So when you can get to a place where you've got your own project and you go, not how, not what I planned on, but it's in a really awesome place. Um, that's a great place to wake up to every morning. And it was a great place for me to end the book. And that's what the epilogue of the book talks about. Um, not what I plan, but, but a really cool place to be. Fantastic. I love the examples in the book too. Tons of great companies that you use um, as examples of how to brand and how to be unpopular on purpose. Um, and, and a lot of companies that, that are not household names intentionally. And I, I think that's really interesting. How did you come up with those? I saw at one point you, you sort of reached out to, to Harrow and asked people if they, if they knew of a company who kind of did this sort of thing. Talk about that a little bit. So know about you and I'm a huge fan of Zappos and I fly Southwest Airlines all the time but if I read one more case study <laughs> about them I, I'm, I'm probably going to explode all over my screen and and I thought that maybe my readers were going to be exactly the same way because the target audience for this book even though it applies to you know brands of any size and scale and whether they're new or established most of us wake up every morning and we just want to run a business that makes us happy, that gives us the time to do the things that we love doing and allows us to own a business instead of have our business owning us. So what I did is I went out and I found businesses that were privately owned, um, in, in a lot of cases family owned, and asked for examples of, especially with Harrow, which is help a reporter out. It's a place where uh, anybody who's writing or researching anything can ask for resources. And I asked for companies that thought that they fit the mold. And two of the companies in there actually came from uh, research for my column for Entrepreneur Magazine, which was Narragansett Beer and Marination Nation. Um, but the, other, the others were people and, and business owners that were referred to me 
um, who responded to Hero queries, people who knew me through my online presence, and they all just had these incredibly powerful stories to tell. And the thing that I took away from it is, since I do a lot, of, my colleague and I do a lot of work, the majority of our work is with, with the startup community, is, you know what, it's not just the big brands that have fantastic and inspiring stories to tell. We've all been in a place where we started something and there's a reason that we started it. So how is somebody out there just like me running a business and doing it well and what can I learn from them so I don't have to downsize all these yeah. examples yeah. from these massive brands. Well, and, and I think when you, when, you, when you talk about branding and brand personality, I think it's oftentimes easier for smaller businesses to do that well anyway because you're, you're closer to the customer. Right. You get Absolutely. into you get into big corporations like layer, 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 and, and the founder or the um, sort of C-suite is so far away from the front lines that it's hard to to get that kind of cultural uh, alignment. So it's usually easier to sort of turn that battleship when you get a little smaller company anyway. Yeah, and what businesses can take away after reading the book? I mean, it, m maybe you'll agree the examples that I put in there. It's it's not about me talking at the reader of the book. It's saying, look, this is what I've what I've stumbled across in my career working with brands to so they last regardless of what the the economic conditions are. You know, how do I build a brand that has an audience robust enough to support it through any economic cycle? And that's where I came up with five principles for the unpopular brand. And you know, a lot of people think that being unpopular means being unlikable. And in fact, it's the exact opposite. Um, what a, the blog that I just put up on uh, the website for the book, which is unpopularbook.com today, talks about a recent ad campaign by Reebok, which was actually just pulled because it came after it, it advocated infidelity. <laughs> so, and it alienated 50% of that brand's audience base. So, to me, that's an unlikable decision because it degrades and insults your audience. When you make an unpopular business decision, it's about honoring your audience. It's about saying, I appreciate the fact that you're here. You are the reason that I get to be in business today, tomorrow, and the next day. And this decision I'm making, while it may not resonate with everyone, it's going to ensure that we're here to do business for you and with you long into the future. Yeah, That's a, what being an unpopular brand is about. Yeah, a big difference between unpopular and unlikable. And so much of when I was reading the book and the, the theory of being unpopular, it's, you know, you, you say stop focusing on, on pleasing people who, who are never going to like you, right? It's this notion of really segmentation and focus. And um, a lot of things that, that we do are with agencies. And that is a, a very typical agency problem where it's like, well, we'll be the agency for anybody who will hire us. And and that is a, a, a sort of road to ruin, right? What you know, be great at one thing instead of being okay uh, at a million things. And and I think that's the that's the key. And I love the actual um, you've got a little chart methodology in the book where you actually an exercise where you say, let's figure out who was never ever gonna hire you. Right? So you do it opposite and because it's really hard for people to say Here's who we're who here's who this business is for, right? That sounds easy, but it's a hard exercise to do. It's easier to say, here's who this business is definitely not for. Right. right? And by a process of elimination, you get to your, your core audience. I love that uh, mechanism. Do you do you do that with your clients? I do. And especially working with businesses that are, you know, we, we come across businesses all the time that are in the middle of the life cycle. And they're not just starting off, they've been around for a while and they're wondering why they're not growing. How can I get traction on the next level? And when it, we, we all go all the way back to why are you here? You know, the, the Simon Sinek start with why, hugely powerful concept. And from that why, we figure out, well then, who, who are you talking to? And a lot of times they go, well, everybody needs what we have to offer. And then that, that's, that's when you put the brakes on. And, it, and it's an aha moment because once you figure out that that's the problem, you know, think about the last time you went out with a group of friends. I saw you at South by Southwest. And even when we were, you and I were standing around talking, 
you know, there were things in that conversation that, you know, there were five people standing around. We didn't, we all didn't agree, you know, since when did we hold our businesses to a higher standard than we hold the relationships that rule our lives? Yeah. We have people in our lives who bring incredible value and they're going to disagree. That diversity of opinion, you know, you're not out there as a human being to be loved by everybody. You know, if that were true, you know, I think polygamy would be <laughs> a lot bigger <laughs> part of our <laughs> relationship yeah. culture. But you know, you're a great person. We're all great people for certain people. Your business is exactly the same way. Stop trying to, you know, the person who tried to please everybody in high school, that was the slutty girl. <laughs> Do you want to be the slutty girl of the branding world? Well, the thing is, the reality is that even if you were popular amongst a wider audience, most companies can't actually handle that. They think they want a broader customer base. And then when that customer base actually happens, they're like, oh, wait, I didn't, I, I was wrong. I didn't actually want that, right? It's a, it's business, a realization. They built their business for that. Yeah. They built their business for to be this. Yeah. And that's great. And, you know, if you want to look at a great case example, look at the case study in the very first chapter that was, you know, the hardware store that was founded by a Mennonite missionary. You know, if you ever opened the book and you expected that you would see that case study, it, I got five bucks for you. Yeah. Five bucks. Yeah. But, Yes, That's the ratio great. of Mennonite examples in your book was far higher than I expected. And you know what? It, surprise. The element of surprise. I feel like the Spanish Inquisition. Um, but that's a great example of how an extremely niche business, which is most of the people watching this, you run a niche business, whether you like it or not. Not even Walmart has something for everybody. So it's how a niche business can grow and expand, yet remain true to you know, the founder's initial purpose when he founded the business 55 years ago. It's still family owned. It's a multi, multi, multi million dollar business. You know, they're suppliers to Hollywood. They're family owned. And it's a lovely Mennonite family out of Ohio. And I cannot wait to go visit them. They're just lovely. <laughs> I think there's this pervasive belief that niche means lesser. And all it really means is focused, right? And, right. you know, one's One's a negative connotation and one's a, a positive uh, connotation. And, and I think your book does a lot to uh, dispel that myth, which is uh, fantastic. I think a lot of people will be like, oh, now I get it. It's going to be a book that people keep around and refer back to, which is, I think, always the true test of, uh, of, of excellence and success. Is like, okay, well, I read this three years from now again and be like, yep, it's still good. And, and it's true, it will be. Yeah, and the one thing that... You know, the parallel that I can draw with that is the word unpopular in and of itself. Unpopular has a very negative connotation from when you and I were growing up. And if you were picked last for kickball, that's when being unpopular sucked. You know, you didn't have the cool stuff. You weren't invited to the cool parties, or at least I wasn't. I was unpopular. And as an adult, I have an entirely different perspective on the word unpopular, which is in part the reason that I wrote this book. But Look at it from, you know, this isn't a story that a lot of people know. Actually, I think three people know it. When we were going through the publishing process for this book, there was a publishing house that was interested in the book, even though we had the book with the publisher it's with now. And they were like, oh, we want it, we want it. And then they came back and they said, oh, but we, wanna, we can't put unpopular in the title. Nobody's going to buy it. And I'm like, then you're not my publisher. These, this publisher, they, they've understood it. They get it from the beginning. And I don't know why you're wasting my time. So niche, positive, negative connotation. Unpopular, positive, negative connotation. If you change the way you think about that word, it changes in, in no uncertain circumstances what you're able to do with your business as a business owner. Yeah. Use those words to empower you. Don't use them to hold you, hold you back. In addition to the to the sort of focus on a particular audience, which is sort of the theme of the book, there's a lot in there which was really resonant for me because it's similar to the things that we talked about in in, in our book um, about culture, right? And, and you wrote that businesses and brands begin with the people behind them, uh, that, that there really is no such thing as, as a brand, that a brand is a who, it's never a what, which I think is artfully put. Um, talk about that a little bit and, and how important sort of the personality side of it is. You know, 
for me, personality is, is job one for a brand. Ford thinks it's quality. <laughs> I think it's personality. But think about, you know, if we want to use Ford as an example, um, why, why would they come out and say that quality is job one? Because they want you to understand that their brand is, is, sorry. I, cat alert, cat alert. Um, wow. Um, they want you to understand that their products are reliable. They're there. They're concerned about your experience as a customer and that quality is something that you're never going to have to worry about throughout your ownership and your experience with their brand. Think about the friends that you sit down to dinner with every now and then. You have the friend who, without fail, every time you call him, he's there to take you to the airport. And it doesn't matter what time of the day. You have a friend who will go off the grid for a week if he even catches wind that you're moving. <laughs> you have the person who will always add extra money to the tip when you're eating as a group. And you have the person in your group who just has the best jokes hilarious and your world is a collection of those personalities but those per those people aren't just the joke teller they're not just the reliable ride to the airport there's people behind them but those leading qualities are what makes you go for everything you are and more importantly for everything you're not I'm glad you're in my world yeah. if business owners think about their brand the same way as they think about the people in their lives then you can begin to understand how people keep brands in their lives as friends. And when you have that friendship established, there's a whole other world of dialogue that opens up to you. And it's having a, a brutally honest customer base. That brutally honest customer base is what allows you to do everything else in the book and keep your business growing in the right direction and honoring the people that you built it for in the first place. Because those naysayers are going to come along. But... You don't want to be friends with a person who always cheats on the tip. You don't want to be the person who always slips out the back door before the tab arrives. You don't want to be friends with the person who, you know, never helps you clean up after a party. So who are you going to build your brand to be? And how are you going to sit down at the table with your audience and say, I want to talk to you and I'm really glad you're here. It's a challenging concept for a lot of companies, though, because they assume, um, because they've been taught to believe this, um, that business is about uh, transactions, right? And that right. it's about talking about yourself and marketing the business. Uh, and, and what you talk about is that we need to sort of transcend the transactional um, and that 80% of the things you talk about should not be about your company. Without a doubt. I mean, nobody likes to be, I'll go back to the people that you sit and have dinner with. You don't invite the person who is me, 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 and, and you just, you do this, you leave, you, it's the same when you're at a business function and somebody walks up and interrupts your conversation and derails it. You want to be surrounded by people who don't just, they, they empower you to talk about yourself when it's appropriate because they're genuinely interested in what's going on. But you're way more interested in what's going on with them because as a business owner, that's data. That's the most powerful information you can have to shape your future business decisions. Because if your audience is saying, you know, responding to things and going, God, you know, money's tight or God, you know what? I love this product or I wish it came in orange or, you know, I would be willing, you know, I love it. I would pay twice as much for it. Well, guess what? Your customers just gave you the best pricing product and, and business planning decisions, you know, data that you could have to make your decisions. So tuning that out is, you know, I, the biggest thing is I think a lot of brands and, and business people out there have been taught that businesses have to be infallible and they have to be flawless and that they're, they're not able to make mistakes. Again, it goes back to when did we hold our businesses to a higher standard than we hold ourselves? Yeah. I screw up daily. I should have turned left. I missed my turn. I, I forgot something at the store. I, I have an email sitting in my outbox in, in my drafts folder. How many of us have emails sitting in our drafts folder right now that we've been working on all day? So we, we all make mistakes and missteps and gaps. And the ability for a brand to grow and prosper in this day and age 
it'll only happen if your brand is human and your customers recognize your brand is human because humans are allowed to make mistakes and your humans, your customers, recognize that fact and they'll forgive it if you, if you cop to the mea culpa. Yeah, I mean, they, they say that, right, the measure of a, a man, the measure of a company is not how they do when times are good, but how they do when times uh, are less than good. And I think that that is evidenced um, every day. There's lots of success stories um, of, you know, people coming to the defense of brands when they're fairly or unfairly kicked. And, and you just have to build that, you have to build that tribe, right? You got to build that that advocacy and personality is, is how you do that, right? You don't build advocates by having awesome bullet points or 30% off sales, you know, it just doesn't really work like that. Um, that's such a fleeting momentary um, sort of connection that really there's no, there's no heart in that, you know, it's all, it's all head. One of the things that, that you said that I love, we talked about some similar things in our book, but it's really hard to do in practice, is you said that every person you hire should reflect your brand personality, right? That everybody in the company should sort of be on the same page from a personality perspective. I totally agree with that. Um, but I find that it's really hard to do that, right? Because in some cases you can't find a person to do that job who has that personality, or in some cases, frankly, the people doing the hiring don't really understand the brand personality either. And so it sort of falls apart or people have a personality that you think they have when you interview them. And then it turns out that they have a totally different personality. Um, yeah, yeah. It's like dating. Yeah, it is like, wow, I didn't realize you're quite that freaky in the interview process. <laughs> Um, I've had a few of those. So how do you how do you do that? Like what what advice do you give people? Sort of the you know uh, hire slow, fire fast kind of mentality. Yeah, you know what? In, in investing in your employees when you're hiring, you're growing and scaling business. Those are the people who you, your employees are just as much your customer as your customers. The people buying your product because. Those employees are going to be advertising for you the minute they leave work before they come into work. I work for so and so, and and if you have somebody who feel you feel just represents your brand and gets it and is excited to be there, that's the person I give a chance. And when you start to feel like that person is more of a liability than an asset to the company, that's the time to sit and just have the fish or cut bait conversation. And Sometimes it's hard because we feel like people are trainable. They need a little more work. They need the benefit of the doubt. We'll get there. We'll get them there. Yeah, yeah. We'll because God, God love you. You know, we love to believe that in in the beauty of the human spirit. So, and when you put yourself in a position where you're investing more time in unjacking a jacked up employee than you are in improving your business. And that's probably the time where it, it's right to look for a replacement. But the the best guideline that I can give is people will tell you who they are in you know the first couple times that you meet them, and don't be so quick to hire that you take everything. Oh my God, I just met this person and they're awesome. Yeah. It's great to be excited about that, but get somebody else in there. Get a get another brain to help make you that decision. It's great to have that devil on your shoulder and trust your gut. I can't remember the last time that my gut was wrong. Yeah. Can you? Yeah, I know what you mean, especially about especially about personnel. No question. And you know, they say in you know, they say in sports you can't teach speed, uh, and I think in business you can't teach personality. Right? You either you either sort of have it or you don't have it or you have the the kind that's right for that business or it's not. It's really hard to say we're going to put you through our training program so that you actually care about customers. It's going to be great. Right. Oh. Right, right. So, so what you're asking is you're going to ask is you're going to put a zebra in a training program and ask it to come out of Jaguar. Yeah. It's, it's not going to happen. So get a, get, a, get a second opinion, have another head help you make that decision. And understand that, you know what, even if you hire someone, um, sometimes moving someone out of your organization is the best thing you can do for your brand's yeah. integrity. Yeah. I want to do a, a project. Sometimes, you know, we crowdsource stuff all the time. You know, what do you think of this logo or, you know, whatever. I want to start crowdsourcing employees, right? So go to this customer community, this advocacy group and say, okay, here's three candidates for a job. Um, you guys interview them via live streaming Facebook or whatever. And let, let your fans pick your new employee. That's what I think we should do. Wow. Okay. I, when you launch that, I want to see I'm going to do that. I'm gonna, I don't think I have the balls to do it for my company, but I'm going to recommend it to a client and make them do it.
That's how we do it. Hey, I've got a startup and here's an idea for you. Yeah, exactly. That's a good startup idea. There we go. The the book was awesome. I really, really enjoyed reading it. It is a a breath of fresh air, as are you. um, And it it was really, really useful. Uh, Really well written, too. No surprise, given your background. Um, But uh, I'm super proud of it. I, I know you are, too. And everybody should pick up a copy of it. It's really, really useful. Thank you so much. It's um, it's been a labor of love, and I, I'll tell you this: not all all of you who who decide to buy the book, um, you're not going to love it, and that's okay. But hopefully, you take some great things for your business out of it. And the one thing that I'll close out by saying is, you know, remember how I said there's no case studies by those behemoth brands that we're tired of. There's also none of those. There also aren't any of those crappy end of the chapter workbooks which right. some of us have publishers that say yeah. we have to put those in. And I was like, yeah. no, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So what I did is I built a fully interactive forum. So if you have ideas to share about the book, head on over to unpopularbook.com and click the tab, get into it. There's also a, at the end of the book, there's an appendix that tells you how to use the forum. And we want to hear from you. And I thought it would be great to just have the conversation start when somebody closes the back cover and to carry on that, those ideas and have it be a continually growing kind of wiki knowledge base for other entrepreneurs, even if they've never read the book, to go to the forum and go, hey, I had that question too. And it's powered by Get Satisfaction, which oh, is nice. actually Great. Yeah. one of the case studies in the book. Yeah. And um, so I'm using a company that is not a client. Um, I'm paying full price for the service, but I believed in what they had to offer, and hopefully you'll join us over there. Look at Erica, eating her own dog food. How about that? Nicely hey, done. Yum, 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 yum. Nicely done. I will be on the forum. I'm going to be in there. I'm going to mix it up. Do it up. <laughs> Please, just, just, go, just go, go start, start some stuff I'll up. I'll do it. So. I, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> no. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Oh, thank you, and thanks, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. it.